So, uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you all to, and welcome our distinguished panelists to this discussion on sustainable development goals and the IOM migration governance framework. I will shortly introduce each of the panel members individually just before each one speaks. Uh, but let me first make just a few initial remarks to set the scene. Uh, many of you will recall that in 2013, this council passed a resolution number 1270. The resolution requested IOM to continue to engage in what is now the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development process. The whole idea was that we would inform and support you as member states in your work on migration and development. We were asked to do a, a number of things in that resolution. First of all, to take part in the final intergovernmental consultations on the Sustainable Development Goals. Secondly, we were asked to work within the UN task team of which we were designated as a member for the post-2015 agenda in order to support the negotiations with technical expertise and advice on the formulation of the text and the evidence base for the SDGs. Thirdly, we were asked to organize together with our partners uh, a number of events. The purpose of the events would be to inform the negotiations. And I've given you one example on the screen here. We did a side event at the high-level political forum on the 1st of July on the question of migration and human mobility. And then finally, we were asked to take part in the deliberations of the interagency expert group on the SDG indicators. The overall, the overarching objective was that we would establish a viable indicator of progress in respect of the SDG target on facilitating safe and orderly migration through well-managed migration policies. And we are suggesting to you that the migration governance framework could be probably for us the best benchmark uh, to conduct such a review. Now in September, uh, the General Assembly adopted, of course, as you know, the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development. And migration is broadly referred to throughout the agenda the political de declaration recognizes the, quote, positive contribution of migrants for inclusive growth, unquote, and the, quote, multidimensional reality uh, of migration. Uh, I, for one, have never understood the debate in the UN about migration and development. Uh, I happen to come from a country which I know was built on the backs and with the brains of migrants. So I'm not sure what the discussion is all about, but I'm glad they've come to a conclusion that migration has something to do with development. Very, very important conclusion. Um, so we have a specific target, the most important one perhaps for us, a goal 10 on reducing inequalities that says we should be facilitating orderly, safe, regular, and responsible migration and mobility of people. Also, the situation of migrant workers is mentioned specifically in the SDG on decent work and economic development. Trafficking is referred to as, quote, modern day slavery, unquote, which should be abolished. And the situation of trafficked women and children is given special recognition. You may recall in yesterday's debate, I forget which member state it was, brought to our attention that there's, with the movement now through the Western Balkans, there's been a, a large increase in the trafficking of, of unaccompanied minors. And I think we can expect that to increase because they're very vulnerable. Um, so migration is indirectly of relevance for targets also on sustainable cities and on resilience in the face of climate change. So therefore, no longer is human mobility being looked at as just the background context for development, or worse, that migration and human ability is merely a reflection of the lack of development in a country. Rather, with the SDGs, migration is now seen as an issue to act upon 
to enhance sustainable development. And IOM, as an important actor, is both advising on the prioritization and implementation on the ground, even though I have to admit it's still very unclear how we're going to get into that process since there's nothing in there that defines it. And we're not part of the UN, so we'll be looking for ways to make sure that we, we do our part. Uh, let me quickly mention just two more things. IOM is already elaborating a strategy for our continued engagement with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We're going to be contributing our technical expertise, our nearly 65 years of experience from the field in the follow-up and review of the 2030 Agenda. And as I mentioned in my report on Tuesday, we will be organizing two sessions of the IDM uh, the, uh, uh, in 2016 that will be dedicated to the follow-up and review of the SDGs. And this will be an occasion to present the results of our two key partnerships with the Gallup World Poll and the Economic Intelligence Unit uh, and evaluating uh, this on the, on the well-being of migrants and also in evaluating migration policies. So the result of the IDM sessions in 2016, we see also as a possible important input or contribution to the Global Formal Migration and Development and the UN Specialized Commissions within the context of the SDG follow-up and review. And finally, it's quite clear, and there's a lot of emphasis throughout this session, I appreciate it very much, emphasis on action. Let's move from process to action. Because up to now, frankly, a lot of the discussions I've taken part in in the UN have been all about process and very little about action. We want to move beyond that. That's going to be the ultimate test. So we will be working with all of you and other partners in the UN country teams to ensure that migration now becomes an important part of the United Nations Development Assistance Frameworks and other development planning tools. So with that, let me go to our first speaker. We're so pleased that Ambassador David Donahue could join us from New York. He literally just got off a flight this morning, and I'm grateful to you for the sacrifice you've made to be with us. You have been such a key player in the SDGs as the co-chair. Um, the ambassador was, played a key role in the negotiations of both the Anglo-Irish Agreement and of course the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, he then served uh, as Irish ambassador to the Russian Federation, to Austria and German, Germany. And I have seen, I speak to him, I know Fliesen Deutsch. <laughs> we have Biden as well. After serving as the political director of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Dublin, he became the, and is still, Ireland's permanent representative to the United Nations in New York. Ambassador Donahue, as I mentioned, successfully co-facilitated the very difficult task of the intergovernmental negotiations that brought us to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So, Ambassador Donahue, without further ado, the floor is yours. Good morning. Welcome. So pleased to see so many of our stalwart uh, member states still with us today. Thank you very much. I think as you know, this is the first of two panels today, the second of three panels altogether. And I attach a particular importance to this one because we're going to be dealing with the 2030 Agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, and, the, and how the IOM uh, can relate to that in terms of its migration governance framework, uh, which we discussed earlier on the first day. So uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you all to, and welcome our distinguished panelists to this discussion on sustainable development goals and the IOM migration governance framework. <clears throat> 
I will shortly introduce each of the panel members individually just before each one speaks. Uh, but let me first make just a few initial remarks to set the scene. Uh, many of you will recall that in 2013, this council passed a resolution number 1270. The resolution requested IOM to continue to engage in what is now the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development process. The whole idea was that we would inform and support you as member states in your work on migration and development. We were asked to do a, a number of things in that resolution. First of all, to take part in the final intergovernmental consultations on the Sustainable Development Goals. Secondly, we were asked to work within the UN task team of which we were designated as a member for the post-2015 agenda in order to support the negotiations with technical expertise and advice on the formulation of the text and the evidence base for the SDGs. Thirdly, we were asked to organize together with our partners uh, a number of events. The purpose of the events would be to inform the negotiations. And I've given you one example on the screen here. We did a side event at the high-level political forum on the 1st of July on the question of migration and human mobility. And then finally, we were asked to take part in the deliberations of the interagency expert group on the SDG indicators. The overall, the overarching objective was that we would establish a viable indicator of progress in respect of the SDG target on facilitating safe and orderly migration through well-managed migration policies. And we are suggesting to you that the migration governance framework could be probably for us the best benchmark uh, to conduct such a review. Now in September, uh, the General Assembly adopted, of course, as you know, the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development. And migration is broadly referred to throughout the agenda. The political de declaration recognizes the, quote, positive contribution of migrants for inclusive growth, unquote, and the, quote, multidimensional reality uh, of migration. Uh, I, for one, have never understood the debate in the UN about migration and development. Uh, I happen to come from a country which I know was built on the backs and with the brains of migrants, so I'm not sure what the discussion is all about, but I'm glad they've come to the conclusion that migration has something to do with development. Very, very important conclusion. Um, so we have a specific target, the most important one perhaps for us, a goal 10 on reducing inequalities that says we should be facilitating orderly, safe, regular, and responsible migration and mobility of people. Also, the situation of migrant workers is mentioned specifically in the SDG on decent work and economic development. Trafficking is referred to as, quote, modern day slavery, unquote, which should be abolished. And the situation of trafficked women and children is given special recognition. You may recall in yesterday's debate, I forget which member state it was, brought to our attention that there's, with the movement now through the Western Balkans, there's been a, a large increase in the trafficking of, of unaccompanied minors. And I think we can expect that to increase because they're very vulnerable. Um, so migration is indirectly of relevance for targets also on sustainable cities and on resilience in the face of climate change. So therefore, no longer is human mobility being looked at as just the background context for development or worse, that migration and human mobility is merely a reflection of the lack of development. Rather, with the SDGs, migration is now seen as an issue to act upon to enhance sustainable development. And IOM, as an important actor, is both advising on the prioritization and implementation on the ground, even though I have to admit it's still very unclear 
how we're going to get into that process since there's nothing in there that defines it. And we're not part of the UN, so we'll be looking for ways to make sure that we, we do our part. Uh, let me quickly mention just two more things. IOM is already elaborating a strategy for our continued engagement with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We are going to be contributing our technical expertise, our nearly 65 years of experience from the field in the follow-up and review of the 2030 Agenda. And as I mentioned in my report on Tuesday, we will be organizing two sessions of the IDM uh, the, uh, uh, in 2016 that will be dedicated to the follow-up and review of the SDGs. And this will be an occasion to present the results of our two key partnerships with the Gallup World Poll and the Economic Intelligence Unit uh, and evaluating uh, this on the, on the well-being of migrants and also in evaluating migration policies. So the result of the IDM sessions in 2016, we see also as a possible important input or contribution to the Global Formal Migration and Development and the UN Specialized Commissions within the context of the SDG follow-up and review. And finally, it's quite clear, and there was a lot of emphasis throughout this session, I appreciate it very much, emphasis on action. Let's move from process to action. Because up to now, frankly, a lot of the discussions I've taken part in in the UN have been all about process and very little about action. We want to move beyond that. And that's going to be the ultimate test. So we will be working with all of you and other partners in the UN country teams to ensure that migration now becomes an important part of the United Nations Development Assistance Frameworks and other development planning tools. So with that, let me go to our first speaker. We're so pleased that Ambassador David Donahue could join us from New York. He literally just got off a flight this morning, and I'm grateful to you for the sacrifice you've made to be with us. You have been such a key player in the SDGs as the co-chair. Um, the ambassador played a key role in the negotiations of both the Anglo-Irish Agreement and, of course, the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, he then served uh, as Irish ambassador to the Russian Federation, to Austria and German, Germany. And I have seen, as speak to him, I know, in Deutsch. <laughs> yeah, biting his book. Um, after serving as the political director of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Dublin, he became the, and is still, Ireland's permanent representative to the United Nations in New York. Ambassador Donahue, as I mentioned, successfully co-facilitated the very difficult task of the intergovernmental negotiations that brought us to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So, Ambassador Donahue, without further ado, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, um, Director General, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, it's a little unnerving to hear that um, series of um, achievements. Uh, um, I, I'm not sure that um, it, it quite give, um, uh, let's, let's just say that uh, I, um, uh, I find it hard to actually uh, connect that to the SDGs. But anyway, from, from time to time, the experiences I had in the Northern Ireland peace process um, did uh, uh, give me some inspiration for how we would, how we would get over particular um, hurdles in the intergovernmental negotiations. Um, I, I should pay tribute to the IOM for its very detailed um, and impressive engagement in our negotiations as the Director General uh, set out. Um, uh, we had, of course, a vast canvas of issues which had to be covered within the um, negotiations um, and basically a lot of the um, effectiveness of individual organizations came down to their own ability to lobby um, discreetly for a particular language uh, to be used and I have to say the IOM was uh, extremely um, effective in that regard. I'm, I'm glad that it was possible to um, have a number of references 
in the final document to the uh, to migration and related issues. On the whole, there wasn't particular controversy about that, but um, there was, let's say, a basic unwillingness on the part of some uh, member states or some groups to add to the draft goals and targets which had already been set in the uh, so-called open working group. I mention that because um, the targets to which the Director General refers were set in the previous open working group um, negotiation. It would have been uh, desirable perhaps to be able to add to or extend those in the final document, but uh, because of a general reluctance to touch the careful compromises across the board uh, which had been worked out in the in it, which had been agreed in the open working group, we were unable to uh, make any significant changes in the intergovernmental negotiations. But within the declaration, which was a new piece of work, uh, the declaration to accompany the SDGs, it was possible to have a paragraph, uh, which in fact the Director General has, has summarized. Um, it, it took one or two efforts before we got the tone and the content of that paragraph right, but essentially we uh, accentuated the positive uh, contribution which, mi which migration makes to sustainable development and economic growth. Um, and uh, I, I'm pleased with the, the outcome. Now, the, uh, the emphasis, of course, is on uh, implementation of the entire framework. We had um, a number of, or we have a number of references also to migrants as a, um, a, a category which is discriminated against, if I can summarize it like that. Um, and uh, again, um, with one exception, that was uh, uncontroversial. Um, we uh, did have originally a reference to migrants regardless of migratory status. Um, that uh, it disappeared in one sentence eventually because of a, um, an overall um, difficulty in reaching a consensus among the 193 countries on human rights references. So we deemed it necessary to go back to the Rio language. One consequence of that was that that particular qualification, regardless of migratory status, uh, it had to be dropped, but on the other hand, we put in the word all at the beginning of that sentence, and that in fact achieves the same effect. I don't mean to get too technical about it, but I just wanted to demonstrate that some care was was uh, uh, taken in, uh, in, in covering the references to migrants um, throughout the text. Um, so, as to, as to uh, the role which the IOM can play in the, and indeed must play in the, uh, in the follow-up and review process. Let me just make perhaps a few general points about the high-level political forum, which will be the main body for global review of implementation. The high-level political forum is, as you perhaps know, a, a subset of, of ECOSOC, or at least it will be operating normally under the auspices of ECOSOC, but every four years it will operate um, under the, uh, the General Assembly and, and uh, will have a, a, the role of broader political guidance on, on, the, on, on those occasions. The high-level political forum it ex exists for the last year or two, but to be honest, it is a skeleton awaiting some flesh, and uh, we now uh, in New York are giving thought to how the, um, the high-level political forum can be um, developed so that it will uh, so that it will be up to the huge challenge facing it. The Secretary General of the United Nations is expected to produce a report early in the new year which will touch on a number of important issues for um, the HLPF, issues about organization, about competence, about working methods and so on. Uh, that report, I'm guessing, will end up having a, a 
general assembly consideration of some kind, which could take a few months. Um, the relevance of that is that at the same time, the actual meeting of the high-level political forum in July of next year needs to be prepared in the usual way with agendas, uh, arrangements and so on. The net effect is that the July 2016 meeting of the high-level political forum will be essentially a transitional uh, meeting. The full cruising speed, as it were, will not be reached until um, uh, July 2017. I don't mean to get uh, too bogged down in process, but I just wanted to let you know that uh, we will not have a perfectly functioning uh, high-level political forum next July, but rather one which is trying to to get its own basic rules and procedures worked out. Now, there will be two basic approaches each year uh, in the high-level political forum. One is a thematic approach, a thematic um, uh, analysis of how we're all doing uh, in implementing the goals. And the second will be uh, an opportunity for member states, those who want to do so, to report on, um, on, on how they are getting on, on the responses that they have been giving at national level um, and indeed at regional level. So broadly speaking, those, uh, the, the meetings of the high level political forum will have those two segments. The reason why I mention that is because the IOM will therefore have an opportunity to contribute to the thematic part of the HLPF meetings. By thematic, I mean that there is likely to be a systematic review of each goal and therefore of all the targets under each goal. So that means that in due course we will be reaching 10.7 and, and the other uh, targets which relate to, uh, to migration issues. So therefore that's the first door into the, uh, the follow-up and review the thematic part of each annual HLPF meeting. The second uh, part is, the, uh, is what the member states will be reporting about national and regional uh, implementation. And again, uh, there will be an opportunity for the IOM, it seems to me, to, to contribute in, in, in via dialogue with the individual member states, it, 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 be the IOM and indeed all the stakeholders relevant to migration issues can uh, interact with, can engage with member states uh, in the period coming up to each high level political forum to frankly put pressure on them to demonstrate that they will be, that they are um, uh, implementing the uh, provisions of, um, uh, of 10.7 and the other uh, couple of references. So, um, I mean, I'm simplifying a, the procedure mainly because in New York we are nowhere near precise detail on this. We're just really um, in the foothills. Um, the Secretary General's report will be the first official uh, moment um, for uh, deciding on uh, the, the structure and working methods of the HLPF, but until then, we are really just brainstorming. It's, it's more or less a, a, a blank page. Um, the president of ECOSOC has the responsibility to make the arrangements for the HLPF meetings, and uh, he will um, uh, be setting an agenda fairly shortly and a theme for the, um, uh, the July meeting. The theme, well, it's anybody's guess, but one possibility which has been mentioned is that we would take something like leaving nobody behind, or more particularly ensuring that nobody is left behind and that we reach the furthest behind first. Those of you who have read the declaration may recognize those um, terms, those phrases. They are central to the equality uh, aspects of uh, or the focus of the of the agenda. So one possibility is that the theme of the HLPF meeting in July, even though it won't be a fully fledged meeting, will be foc will, will, that that the theme will be ensuring that nobody is left behind. That puts the focus on what member states are doing operationally uh, to um, to translate this principle of, of equality in, in, into practice. Uh, 
So, Director General, I'll probably leave it at that for the moment um, and to let other members of the panel uh, contribute, but I'm very, very happy to um, try to answer points and questions which, which you may have. I'm sure I, I want to so thank you very much in the name of all of us. This has given us an excellent uh, scene setter, a background on which we can uh, uh, move to our other speakers, but particularly pleased to have more details on how this whole thing is shaping up, even though it's still in a fairly amorphous uh, state. Uh, it's nonetheless very encouraging to know that, at least from our very parochial point of view, there are possibilities for us to become somehow engaged in the review and implementation uh, process. So thank you very much for that. I'm sure that's going to evoke a lot of questions here this morning. A very good panel. Let me move right along and uh, introduce uh, Claire Melamed, who is the director of the Growth, Poverty, and Inequality Program, speaking of equality, <laughs> of the Overseas Development Institute. Uh, she is leading the Institute's work on the uh, 2030 Agenda. Um, Ms. Melamed recently served as the lead author of UN Secretary General's expert group on the data revolution and the co-lead on the groundbreaking, quote, My World survey with the UNDP. And she was previously the head of, the, of policy at Action Aid in the United Kingdom and has undertaken field work with the UN, as I understand it, in Mozambique and has taught at the University of London and the Open University. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director General, um, and thank you all for being here and to IOM for the, um, for the invitation. It's a particular pleasure, as I think we all feel, as, as the Director General said, to be here talking about migration in the context of the Agenda 2030 and the new Sustainable Development Goals. As all of you know, migration was not mentioned specifically in the Millennium Development Goals. Um, it wasn't simple, as we've heard, to get it into the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think, first of all, would like to congratulate many of my fellow panelists and many of the um, countries represented here today who worked very hard to get the mentions of migration that we do see scattered throughout the, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and really now that you know this presents those of us who care about migration and migration policy with a huge opportunity to use these new tools to try to affect change on the ground and change in outcomes for migrants, for the countries from which they come and to which they go. I think there are really three ways that I want to just run through quickly today is to, to think about how migration has been incorporated into the Sustainable Development Goals and therefore how these new tools, these new goals might be used as levers to affect change. The first one, of course, we've already heard about is the ways in which migration is mentioned directly through the goals. We've just heard about um, you know, some examples of that in goal 10 on um, orderly, uh, orderly migration policy, others on relating to education, relating to employment and so on. And these are very important specific targets to hold governments to account for specific policy areas and for their treatment of particular groups of migrants and the outcomes for those particular groups. Um, I think, how, however, that in the discussion on migration in the SDGs, there is a risk of stopping there. That isn't all there is to migration in the SDGs. And that may in the end not even be, it's an important entry point, but in terms of the kind of change that can be affected around migration for the SDGs, that may not in the end turn out to be the most important new tool that we have. Um, Another really important way to think about migration in the SDGs has already been mentioned is to think about migrants as a group and to link that to the appeal which has very wide support from member states, from civil society and others to really call to use the new goals as a tool to leave no one behind and to focus attention throughout the agenda on the very poorest but to try to use that as a tool not just to think about poverty in the abstract, but to understand why it is that people end up without income, without education, without healthcare. What are the characteristics of particular groups 
that mean that they are discriminated against and disadvantaged. And clearly, migrant status is one important characteristic which determines outcomes for people and which needs to be brought into the conversation on Leave No One Behind. I'm sure this group needs no reminding that, for example, half of Syrian refugee children are out of school. If we're going to meet the global aspiration to educate all children, we simply cannot do that without tackling the specific needs and circumstances of migrant children. The same will be true of other access to other services, access to healthcare, access to water and sanitation. Meeting the universal aspiration to provide all people with these services and with good outcomes in the areas of health and education simply can't be done without governments, without civil society organisations, without multilateral organisations looking specifically at the circumstances and the specific needs of migrant populations around the world. Um, Gender-based violence is another one which has also been mentioned. Another issue which has come into the new sustainable development goals, perhaps to a much greater extent than we saw in the Millennium Development Goals, and an area where, again, women migrants face particular risks and dangers. And unless we understand those and use the opportunity of the Sustainable Development Goals and the political pressure that they create as a way, as a lever to change policy in this area, we're not going to be able to meet the universal aspirations to tackle gender-based violence. Having the goals is one thing. I think actually using the goals to affect the changes in these outcomes for migrants that we want to see is going to require at least, possibly more, but at least two new things. The first, and it, as the Director General said, I've recently been working a lot on issues of data, so it won't surprise anybody to hear me say this, is that we need to know more. Like other groups of largely invisible people, we know we have very little good data on migrants. I mean, this comes from, stems from two specific issues around data on migrants. Firstly, in common with other groups who are disadvantaged, the political pressure to invest in data on those groups tends to be very weak. It's expensive, it's difficult, we don't really know how to do it. So actually encouraging governments and others to invest in collecting good data on migrants is difficult. But again, the call to leave no one behind and the recognition that migrants are a specific group that are in many cases being left behind um, should increase the, the, the demands for more resources, for more research, for more understanding of how to collect data and understand the particular needs of those populations. There is also, of course, a particular issue around migrants which is not common to data but which data collection systems tend to be pretty nationally based. We see have national statistical offices, we have national systems, we have national standards um, and protocols around data but almost by definition many migrants are moving across borders and the, um, the, the adequate tracking and data collection of migrant populations is going to require more cooperation between countries in data collection that perhaps we've seen to date and that presents a, an interesting and by no means insurmountable but interesting challenge and a need for, for new partnerships and new ways of thinking about data collection which again are entirely appropriate for the aspiration for a universal development agenda. A second way of course in which we hope that the call to leave no one behind can lead to specific changes for migrants and for migrant populations is in the use of the Sustainable Development Goals as a political lever to, for change. We've just heard from the Ambassador about how the, the official reporting, the following up, the follow up and review processes are coming into shape and of course there will be a moment there for governments to report on what they're doing, to hold each other to account um, for, for what, for progress, for global progress on the SDGs can't meet the universal aspirations for progress unless all governments play their part. But I think we shouldn't see the SDGs as simply a once in a year 
moment that the success of the SDGs and their value as levers for change will also depend on other groups, on civil society groups, on researchers and others using this opportunity, using in a sense this new tool in the toolbox um, to try to, in, to understand what it means to achieve those goals, what the pathways are to achieve them and how governments and others can work together to, to do that. The, um, so the third way in which I think migration is going to be important in the achievement of the SDGs, as well as so we have specific goals that specifically mention migration and migration policy, we have migrants as a specific group, and how, if we're going to meet the aspiration to leave no one behind, that, going to, that requires attention and knowledge of the specific circumstances of migrant populations in many areas. But I think the third way in which migration is going to affect the outcomes of the SDGs is through broader processes of economic growth and demographic change. Clearly this is a 15 year uh, project, the SDGs, and a lot is going to happen in that time within countries and between countries. And as we know, you know, as we see all the time, um, countries change, economies grow, economies shrink, capital moves around the world, goods move the around the world in trade. Um, and these are absolutely essential forces shaping the progress of countries and of the world as a whole. Demo demography changes too. And we see, you know, again and again, most recently from the World Bank, in the recent Global Monitoring Report, very compelling evidence about how demographic trends are shaping societies and are shaping patterns of growth um, and patterns of growth and production and investment in societies and ultimately it's going to be long-term trends particularly in economic growth and in the distribution of that growth which are likely to have the greatest effect on our success or failure in meeting the sustainable development goals and demographic change is an absolutely essential component on that it's always struck me as somewhat odd that while we are very happy, not least just down the road from here in the World Trade Organization, to, to get together to um, try to design systems which allow goods and money to move around the world as freely as we possibly can, understanding that that is good for growth and good for the kind of dynamic economies that we all want to see. It's proved much more difficult in getting international agreements to allow the same thing to apply to people. Um, the kind of essential third leg, as it were, of a global system. Um, but I think we are starting to see pressures building up. You know, we, we know, I think we, I'm sure this audience needs no reminding of the figures that we have some young and growing economies and some old aging and shrinking economies. And for economies, to, for all of our countries to, glow, to grow and to flourish, we're going to need people to move around between, from, from, from places where there are young populations who don't have work to populations where there are eight to places where there are aging populations and people who need looking after. I mean, now my uh, the National Health Service in the UK is a my own country of the UK is a, a glaring example of this. So I think, in the long run, success for economies for the kind of flourishing, growing, dynamic economies that we all want to see, which are going to be absolutely pivotal in the success of the achieving the sustainable development goals is also going to depend on longer term patterns of migration and demographic change. Of course, those are the hardest to achieve and there are many good political reasons why that is a, a very, very difficult thing to, to do. But I think my hope is that over time, the sort of common, the collective project of the sustainable development goals and the aspiration of a universal agenda can help to be one of the, the sort of common global norms which starts to move countries towards that direction and towards understanding our common interest in resolving some of these problems of migration that we're, we're seeing all too vividly in Europe at the moment. So I think, just to conclude, I think the SDGs offer us a fantastic opportunity to change the conversation on migration and development, to change the way that we talk and think about it as we're all doing today and as the where the IOM has, has so successfully led the way in, forming, in formulating the goals. 
but I think they also provide us with a fantastic new set of tools to change the outcomes, which, after all, is really the point. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms. Malamede, for a very thoughtful presentation uh, to follow on from that of uh, Ambassador Donahue, uh, outlining for us the three, three ways in which these references to migration in uh, f four of the targets might well be used. Uh, I think we've all listened carefully to that and picked up a lot of ideas. Obviously, in a more parochial way, we appreciate the reference to data, appreciate the reference to using uh, using uh, the SDGs as a political lever to affect change, the whole idea of linking us up with uh, economic development and demographic change. We quite frankly are, are baffled up to now how the public mind can link up migration and terrorism overnight and cannot link up migration and the demographic deficit. And as I was saying in my opening remarks, you will not solve the demographic deficit with a compassion deficit. So we, we've got to find a ways to make that argument so that countries can see migration movements essentially as working in the national interest between Global North and Global South. So a very interesting presentation. Thank you. And I'm also noticing you use WTO. They're just down the hill from us, but we're miles apart in terms of movement of people and capital goods and services. Um, let me move quickly to our third speaker. We're very happy to have an old friend back with us. Uh, Jabril uh, Fall, uh, been a friend of ours in, in both Geneva and in our office in London. He's London-based. He's currently director of a, a UK-based company that advises on socially responsible businesses, ethnical business uh, models and practices, Islamic finance and corporate responsibility. He is on many boards and, and in many agencies. He's a board member, for example, of the ECUN Joint Migration and Development Initiative also chairman of the African Foundation for Development of Ford, which I think is uh, one of our, our most active uh, observer, <laughs> observers in IOM. It's a charity that works to extend and enhance the role that diaspora uh, can play. And he's also a founder of another group called Remit Aid, which is a program to transform res remittances into a sustainable form of international development finance. Uh, He's played a very active role also in all of the civil society days that the various, uh, the seven or eight uh, uh, global forums on migration and development have been held. Uh, Mr. Fowl, you have the. Thank you very much, Director General. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to join you in this um, council meeting, being the first one since the adoption of the 2030 agenda and an important one for IOM with the adoption of the migration governance framework and of course the opening of the negotiations to join the UN. My comments um, would be focused on perhaps what approach we should use to implement the SDGs. Like many of you, there is a little bit of concern and a little bit of anxiety as to whether we would be able to live up to the aspirations reflected in the SDGs. And the concerns are legitimate indeed, because many a good policy has withered away for want of implementation. So inaction is a worry. In this area of migration and development, reversals is a serious and present worry in that what is in the public interest is not always necessarily of interest to the public. When it comes to migration, the DG have just reminded us, within a short time, we see what I would perhaps call manufactured public consent or con public interest being very narrow, being very protective to the detriment of some of the sentiments that are in the SDGs and the whole discussion of migration and development. And sometimes I do feel sympathy for our political leaders because of course they do need to win that public vote. And so they react to it. Unfortunately, it is to our disadvantage overall. 
and the public good suffers. So my reflections then focuses on what can we do within the context of those serious and present realities of possible reversals. I would suggest a number of things. First, in terms of implementing the letter of the SDGs, that I think we need to be perhaps a bit creative because as we've heard from Ambassador Donahue, a lot of negotiations in the very wording of the SDG have taken place, which betrays the sentiments of the progressive and perhaps not progressive sort of member states, nations in terms of these negotiations. So the wording that we have can effectively be used at a very basic level or it can be used to open up a whole lot of good. My suggestion then is that for the implementation, we just take the literal wording as the red light. It is nothing more than the red light. We have to move. So I think we need in our individual countries to take the spirit of the SDG more importantly. And the spirit is the undeniable nexus between migration and development. If we take that spirit, it allows us to set our own targets, our own indicators that perhaps go further than what um, we have. Why is it important to go perhaps further than what we have? One is because it's, it's only safer. To achieve the targets, it's safer that we try to do more so that if we fail, we still at least hit the threshold. That's number one. Number two is that implementation is difficult. And in some countries, some countries are ahead of others in terms of what the agreements are. And the agreement of the SDG is a compromise. It is not necessarily the low, lowest common um, level, but at least it was a compromise. So we have to set our own personal targets or individual country targets. We are seeing this in the discussions now in relation to the indicators that follows from um, the targets. There's a sense we still do not have a very clear view as to how the indicators would be sorted out. But I would not be surprised if there would be many actors who are unhappy about the indicators that we end up having. So instead of remaining in that state of unhappiness and querying it, we as individual countries can set our own targets, make it ambitious, make it reflect the spirit rather than just the letter of an international agreement. There are other reasons why sort of this more ambitious approach in implementation is important. If you take 10.7, which I think perhaps it's the biggest category, planned and well-managed migration, you may not be surprised to know that this is susceptible to perverse interpretation. For a country that want to interpret that as plant and well managed, meaning control and securitization, can indeed use that, this agreement for that purpose. That's not the spirit of it, but the letter of it does not exclude that perverse and perhaps retrogressive interpretation. So those who support the nexus and want to see it work should normalize the benefits of migration and development by hitting, setting targets for themselves beyond what's needed and doing it so much so that any reversals would even take us back to a threshold that's better than where we are in 2015 today. Another point is if you take a whole category of migrants who certainly are not refugees, they are not highly skilled migrants, and these are the people who tend to find themselves in difficulty. 
And these are the group of people who are also extremely useful to many economists. There is no explicit, clear focus on them, and that would have been difficult to get. And I would say progressive nations should focus on this opportunity. You see, the highly skilled migrants can always look after themselves. If you take the highly skilled African footballers, no European nation now can imagine itself without them. That means it's been normalized. So even if the FA in the UK starts talking about reducing the number of foreign players in a team, even if you start working towards that, you would come at a level that is far, far better than how things were several years ago. This is what I mean by normalization. So you have to aim much higher because we cannot guarantee that we will not suffer reversals. In fact, we can guarantee the, the opposite, that we will suffer reversals. But those that sh should not take us backwards, it should take us to a decent threshold. Another example is the 3% reduction of transaction cost on remittance by 2013. Myself particularly, I've been very unhappy about it. Um, Ambassador Donahue is the most lobbied man in 2015. And unfortunately, I didn't get his ear on this one. But I was arguing that 3% by 2030 I don't need that because I already have it. It's not ambitious enough. Today, in many European and American con um, North American countries, you can send remittances for less than 3%. So to set that for a target to 2030, I would say um, it's not ambitious. But the wording, the compromise wording we've got is to reduce to less than. So it gives us a bit of room there. Now. The Valletta, the EU-Africa Valletta summit that just finished, there's been a lot of controversy around it, but I just want to highlight one area. That is when it came to remittances. They had accepted wording, which is in the action plan, that leaves it very open that with Europe and Africa, they may choose particular corridors and walk towards a target more ambitious that want the SDGs set. So the SDGs does give us a framework, but for those of us who support the spirit, I think we do need to be far more ambitious. Last set of comments I would make is in terms of the indicators. That part is far from being settled, and I think the time scale is really between now and perhaps February, March um, to get it settled. The comments I would make for the interest of member states here and the good ambassadors is this. The role of civil society in the indicators. We now know, and I don't think that will be changed, that the indicators would be monitored by the national statistical authorities. For many countries, this is the first time these authorities would be dealing with some of these interesting development indicators. So I would suggest that we push for the national statistical authorities to be independent. In some countries they are, in many they are not. So support for independence of these statistical authorities. Support for capacity building of these um, statistical authorities. And support for a multiple membership in the governance of these authorities. So that it is not just civil servants, but businesses, civil society, academics are represented. And I would also make a point that civil society perhaps need to be supported to be able to produce their own shadow reports, as it were, um, dealing with different aspects of the indicators. So in sum, my contribution to this debate is we are pleased and grateful for what we have in terms of the SDGs. We had had few months um, to wallow in it, as it were. Now the necessary anxieties have to come back. And it is good, all good anxiety that, is, that we ex extract from it all the positive spirit 
that was behind the promulgation of the specific wording and lettering. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for calling our attention to the key to success of the SDGs is going to be the implementation and to implement them as we would hope uh, is going to require that we look well beyond the letter and that we not use the letter somehow there to uh, basically to in some perverse way to distort the intention of those who who drafted and negotiated and agreed to uh, to the SDGs so we'll work more in terms of the spirit and looking particularly after certain groups uh, including those who who are now being I think unwisely and unfairly Regroup that everybody who doesn't qual qualify for 1951 protection comes under one broad category called economic migrants, which covers, as my mother would say, a world of sin. Uh, there are many other groups in there. So thank you very much for that good presentation. Let me move right along now. To, uh, I've, we've had been patient with our, our fourth speaker, uh, who's also our newest arrival uh, uh, in Geneva, brand new on the job. Uh, Paul Ladd uh, was very recently appointed by the UN Secretary General to be the director of a very important uh, agency, the UN Research Institute on Social Development. Uh, he previously was the director of the UN uh, Development Program, UNDP team, on the post-2015 development agenda. And prior to that, he was leading UNDP's policy team on inclusive globalization. He's also worked as senior economic affairs officer in the executive office of the Secretary General. Mr. Ladd, you have the, the floor. Thank you very much, Director General, uh, Excellences, fellow panelists. Uh, of course, coming last on a panel, sometimes you find that some of the things you want to say have already been taken. But I'll try to keep it uh, short and interesting and to add, uh, to add value. Um, I wanted to cover uh, four things. Uh, the first is just to talk a little bit really about the spirit and nature of the 2030 Agenda. Perhaps also how it's a little bit different from the MDGs and the opportunities that that then um, gives us. Secondly, like Claire, to reflect a little bit on not just the migration content in the SDGs that we find in the, in the target specifically, but also the impact of migration and mobility on the achievement of all the goals and targets in all countries. Thirdly, to talk a little bit about the role of uh, research. And fourthly, to try to address uh, the DG's uh, preoccupation quite rightly with action and talk a little bit about how the multilateral system, all actors and the UN should hopefully now start to uh, step up uh, to the plate. So firstly, on the 2030 um, agenda, Clearly, uh, one of the, I think, most popular critiques that people have made is that the agenda is, is very big, that it's very large. 17 goals, 169 targets, and some of the targets are perhaps less well specified than they could have been. It's certainly an incredibly ambitious agenda, an, a, an agenda that actually responds to the challenges that the world is now facing. One of the uh, somewhat glib ways I respond to the critique on the fact that there are 17 goals and 169 targets is, well, if we'd have sorted some of them out by now, we wouldn't need 17 goals and 169 um, targets. But it certainly is uh, comprehensive. Another asset of the agenda is that it is uh, balanced and integrated across different dimensions. People call them dimensions, but effectively economy, society, the environment and governance. And although the MDGs were a very wel welcome shift back to the social aspects of development uh, in response to a decade, particularly in the 1980s, that had concentrated on economic growth and economic liberalization, um, the MDGs were also somewhat kinky, as Lamp Pritchett would said. They encouraged resource allocation into a narrow number of areas perhaps at the cost of some of these more important or equally important systemic issues, the environment in particular, but also governance, and the many things that the MDGs uh, didn't cover. Lastly, and I think although it will be interpreted in different ways, the expression in the outcome document for the agenda to be universal 
is a real ground uh, breaker, a real game changer. And I want to come back to that in terms of how we think about the impact of migration and mobility on, on the SDGs. I think the second thing worth noting about the agenda is the process that was undertaken to reach the goals and targets. We had an incredibly uh, participatory governmental process through the Open Working Group and then latterly by uh, uh, Ambassador Donoghue and Ambassador Macharia Kamau with all member states negotiating on the words that they wanted to use to convey, convey their vision. But before and in parallel to that, we also had huge participation from civil society, uh, some from business and from, from people directly. Um, Claire is one of my oldest partners in crime in this business and it was Claire and I that put together the My World survey that I think in the end reached out to eight and a half million people around the world and asked them what they cared about. And some of the things that they cared about, decent jobs, better governance, actually found their way into the agenda and that data was used by governments as they made their case in that democratic process. So in a way migration was able to present its case for inclusion. And of course, I, I commend my colleagues from IOM for pressing, pressing their case, but I think it stands on the validity of the substance. Migration is critically important to development. And therefore, it wasn't just uh, the fact that a political filter was used to get the words right at the end, it was a Darwinian survival of migration in the data in comparison to many of the other issues that were presented. That ultimately, we've traded off some degree of simplicity for a much greater degree of ownership. And many of you who worked on the MDGs at country level or uh, in NGOs or in business were probably aware that we didn't really get going on the MDGs for the first five, six, seven years. And with the SDGs, because of the process, because I think of the maturity of the agenda, the prospects are for uh, regaining that lost time with the SDGs and really starting the ground running uh, on January the 1st. So now turning to migration and the SDGs, um, I won't go uh, into the detail again of where trafficking and migration feature in the, in the targets. What I'd like to spend a bit more time on is how the principle of universality means that migration impacts on the achievement of the SDGs across the whole suite of goals and targets and in every single um, country. So if you read uh, the resolution adopted by member states, the definition of universality is actually quite clear. In paragraph four, we wish to see the goals and targets met for all nations and all people. In paragraph five, it is accepted by all countries and is applicable to all. Now, of course, differing country contexts and different configurations of challenges means that it will be incorporated into national policy and implemented in slightly different ways. But I don't think there's any getting away from the interpretation that this agenda applies to every single person and every single country. Now, the reason that's important is because even though migration is mentioned in the targets, I think they're largely designed with the mindset of static countries and immobility in mind. Now, when you have a few people moving, that's probably a reasonable assumption to make. But when you have thousands of people moving, or hundreds of thousands of people moving, or millions of people moving, then actually it starts to warp the fabric of the SDGs and how you think about um, progress. Now the current tragic conflict that we see in Syria and the resulting refugee crisis that we see is very pressing right now, but migration is not uh, an issue that will be going away in decades to come. Continued economic inequalities between countries exacerbated by the impacts of climate change are going to drive increasing numbers of people um, to move. Now, when you think of migrants themselves, generally people are moving because they either have to or they want to. And therefore they're revealing that they think they will be better off when they get to the place that they're going. 
So for that migrant community, for that m community of people that are moving, we can say with some certainty that the SDGs are being reached for that transnational community. But when we look at the issue of countries, it becomes slightly more complicated. We have to look at the numbers of people that are moving, the configuration of their skills, their expertise, their entrepreneurship, their energy, because the impacts are going to be different in receiving countries and sending countries. And in some places, the goals are going to be progressed by movement, but in other countries uh, and other places, the goals will be uh, regressed by movement. And we simply don't know how that will play out. We simply don't know at this point. And I think that's my entry point to, to research. So five weeks ago, I moved to, uh, to Geneva from New York. I'd been in New York for 10 years in a, in a very operational agency, UNDP. Uh, and now my focus is on uh, learning things that we don't know. Now, the UN Research Institute for Social Development has a tremendous heritage of uh, working on things which are a little bit uh, challenging to the mainstream, particularly with a focus on social development and people. We have three research programs. One is on social policy, the second is on gender and development, and the third is on the social dimensions of sustainable development. Now, we've done work on migration in the past, particularly South-South migration and more recently migrant precarity. But I am absolutely committed as the new director to wanting to do more on migration. I think it's absolutely a critical issue and I'll be exploring with colleagues in IOM and beyond how we can make that, um, how we can make that happen. So lastly, um, I wasn't going to include this, but uh, I do want to address the Director General's comment on, on action. We're in somewhat of, a, of an informational void at the moment. The excitement for September has died down. I think people are becoming to realize what this new agenda means. And the UN system and the multilateral system is, is no different. For my last year in New York, I was working on um, a strategy for the UN Development Group to guide its support on implementation of the new agenda. And we titled it MAPS in the end. MAPS stands uh, for Mainstream Acceleration and Policy Support. Now, one of the critical uh, divides that we have to jump is the way that IOM as an institution is brought in to that family that is addressing the SDGs at country level or whether it still sits slightly outside. And I don't believe we can effectively address this agenda with uh, the organization that works on migration outside of country level UN processes and global level review mechanisms. I think it's absolutely fundamental that IOM gets a voice uh, and gets resources within those, uh, within those processes. What we've tried to do in crafting that strategy is recognize the assets that the UN system can bring, both its resident and non-resident agencies, but also the fact that there are billion, millions of people who also want to contribute to implementation, whether they sit in think tanks or uh, the academic community or in the business community. So therefore, there is no one monopoly on providing support to national stakeholders, whether they're in governments or civil society. And I think within that context, if we try to address the challenge of implementation in that multi-stakeholder way, then I think we'll make far better progress even if, of course, as a, as a UN, uh, a committed UN worker, I feel we also have a, a lot of leadership that we can bring as the UN system to supporting countries at, uh, at the national level. Let me stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ladd, for adding additional dimensions uh, to our discussion this morning. Uh, I think that I won't go uh, try to repeat them, but I'm particularly encouraged by the positive uh, view that you have of how migration is going to fit into this very universal set of, uh, of SDGs, uh, emphasis on action and how we can bring others in. It is not, it is not, a, a, it's, it's not a document that's owned by the UN. It's going to it belongs to all of us. It's up to all of us to take action on it. Now, I'm going to go immediately to the an interactive discussion with all of you. I, I think it's been, for me, four very stimulating uh, presentations from different angles.
I think it's a lot of food for thought there. So why don't we start the discussion? As far as I'm concerned, I think we can go over a few minutes. Uh, the, next, uh, the next item is to return to the general debate. So let me eat into a little bit of the general debate time in order to give you opportunity to raise questions, make points that you'd like to, and do try to be as brief as possible. Thank you. Who's the first speaker? Let me start with the first speakers here. I have Mexico as the first speaker, followed by Fiji. Then I saw, I think, uh, Congo, uh, Greece, and Sweden, I believe. Huh? Mexico, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, good morning, Director General. Good morning, everybody. We'd like to begin by thanking all of the panelists for their very interesting uh, comments uh, and ideas. It's very clear to us that including migration on the 2030 uh, agenda is a historic achievement of the international community. And we'd like to underscore that IOM was instrumental in achieving that. Um, its support um, is vital, and um, we should uh, really pay tribute to IOM in that respect. I heard little about uh, the IOM's migration governance framework in those uh, panel remarks, and I think that's an important aspect of this debate that we shouldn't neglect, in particular because the migration governance framework entre otros, en la declaración del diálogo de alto nivel sobre migración y desarrollo en la que se esbozan cuestiones clave referentes a migración y desarrollo. Para México, este marco de gobernanza sin duda contribuirá a apoyar una migración planificada y bien gestionada con el asesoramiento correspondiente and with the relevant uh, advice of IOM on migration issues and the space for exchanges of views and experiences on issues uh, connected uh, to migration and uh, human mobility. I'd like to point out that the three principles and objectives referred to in the governance framework um, complement the operational framework for migration uh, emergency situations that IOM already has. I didn't want to take up too much of your time, uh, Director General, but we are sure that this governance framework puede contribuir a la creación de capacidades nacionales y proporcionar el asesoramiento normativo apropiado para desarrollar programas específicos vinculados al desarrollo de políticas públicas que contribuyan a la implementación de la Agenda de Desarrollo Sostenible 2030. En ese sentido, me gustaría... And in that context, I have a question for the panelists. What do they think are the relevant aspects for migration will be that should be implemented and monitored in the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, with particular emphasis on the role that the IOM could play Considerando, por supuesto, la naturaleza transversal del tema y la diversidad de los actores y organizaciones internacionales, la diversa array de internacionales organizaciones y otros stakeholders involved. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Fiji, you have the floor. Congo, 
Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. Chair. Euh, J'ai l'honneur de prendre la parole euh, au nom du groupe africain pour m'exprimer au cours de ce panel um, sur les objectifs du développement durable et le cadre de gouvernance des migrations the and, uh, et pour féliciter l'OIM like quant à l'importance qu'il accorde à cette thématique um, qui, à n'en point douter, uh, demeure une question d'actualité um, en vue de l'insérer dans le programme de développement so d'ici um, à l'horizon 2030. Je voudrais également agenda. féliciter les panélistes I'd also like to uh, thank leur, the panelists uh, de um, ce for matin. their important uh, comments this morning. And congratulate uh, the administration for having uh, facilitated this discussion. These are matters of great concern. And uh, over recent years, there have been so many meetings and forums um, focusing on these issues. Parce que toutes like les conclusions qui ont été pu prendre, qu'ils ont dû prendre au cours de ces forums servira à orienter et mettre en place une plateforme de gestion des différents mouvements migratoires à travers la planète. Le groupe africain, par ma voix, voudrait relever que le fait du fait des phénomènes sociaux, politiques et environnementaux, le monde assiste au fil des jours à des déplacements de populations sous des formes aussi diversifiées que complexes. En conséquence, des dispositions s'imposent aux structures impliquées, à savoir les gouvernements et les organisations internationales et les organisations non gouvernementales, dans la perspective d'une gestion inclusive des mouvements migratoires. Il s'agit dans ce cadre de tenir aussi bien compte and des droits de l'homme en général sure que des droits des femmes et des, et des enfants particuliers, car ceux-ci constituent les couches les plus vulnérables lors des mouvements migratoires. Um, de redoubler d'efforts en matière de conditions d'accueil des migrants, d'améliorer le règlement des problèmes administratifs ainsi que l'accès aux services sociaux de base. Par ailleurs, le groupe africain voudrait souligner que l'OIM doit figurer en tant que partie prenante de tous les débats sur la question de la migration um, au niveau international, régional et sous-régional. Monsieur le Président, en considérant de près les drames liés Chairman, aux récents mouvements migratoires uh, au Moyen-Orient et en Afrique, uh, le groupe africain Africa note que des leçons devaient être tirées afin de susciter des directives en matière de protection to, uh, et de prise en charge des migrants. Uh, Celles-ci constitueraient de meilleures pratiques and, uh, à consigner et à appliquer dans le cadre des renforcements des capacités des acteurs en charge de la mise en œuvre du cadre de gouvernance des migrations. En conclusion, le groupe africain remercie l'administration pour l'intérêt accordé à cette problématique et réaffirme sa volonté de ne ménager aucun effort dans la mise en œuvre de la résolution sur le cadre de gouvernance des migrations que nous accueillons favorablement en encourageant son application effective dans les politiques nationales de gestion des flux migratoires. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. I'm going to proceed by trying to get as many of you as possible into the discussion and then simply ask our four panelists if they would maybe respond to these or, or, or have a concluding remark, I think, rather than trying to answer each individually now in the interest of time. Uh, Greece, um, you have the floor. General, um, we, uh, we want to thank the panelists for their presentations, and my question refers to the collection of data, which of course is of very big importance, and we want to commend IOM for their valuable contribution in this field. Um, the migration governance framework uh, mentions that uh, the term credible, this data needs to be credible. And my question refers mostly to Mrs. Melamed since she mentioned it in her speech. Uh, which do you believe are the proper safeguards in order to ensure the, cred the, the credibility of this data, not so much on the part of the states because we believe Mr. Fall uh, made some uh, uh, important references to this uh, in his speech, but rather on the part of the potential partners, since you said that there is a need for partnerships in this field. Thank you. Thank you. Sweden? Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Director General, and good morning to all colleagues uh, around the room. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the panelists for really very interesting interventions. Um, Sweden shares the evaluation that it's a tremendous achievement uh, to have agreed on the ambitious goals on migration uh, within the 2030 agenda. Finally, 
there are clear and unquestionable commitments uh, on the UN level. Undoubtedly, this fact will boost efforts and attract resources in this area, both nationally and globally. How much is, however, yet to be seen? If goals are viewed as uh, complicated, they risk to be sidestepped by other priorities. Therefore, all steps towards concretization and transparency will have a potentially positive effect. Some commitments uh, on migration in the SDGs are easy to measure, such as lowering the transfer costs of remittances. Defining and measuring orderly, safe, regular and responsible migration is a completely different challenge. In only a few words, <coughs> That commitment frames the essence of migration governance and exposes the challenges linked to its definition in national contexts. Luckily, IOM was proactive on this issue. IOM's work on developing the migration governance framework is of great quality and value. The MIGOF is the best attempt we have seen to identify the policies that could enable orderly, safe, regulated and responsible migration. IOM has managed to be sensitive to national and regional context and has succeeded to create a tool which is comprehensib uh, comprehensible and comprehensible as well as operationally and universally relevant. Sweden is a long time advocate of intensified discussions on global governance on migration. In our view, the adoption of the MIGOF at the Council session is a milestone in, discussion, in global discussions on migration governance in that it provides an essential element of deciphering what is central to our discussions and goals. Uh, IOM's foresight and work on the MIGOF show proof of the organization's strength and of its experience in the full width of the migration area. The timing and forthcoming thinking on this, starting already early on, the <coughs> in, early on in the negotiations of the post-2015 uh, agenda, gives evidence to what the organization has developed into over the last decennium. Today, IOM is so much more than an operational service provider. We applaud IOM for providing the membership with MIGOF directly after the finalization of the 2030 negotiations. IOM's expertise, participation and impact need to be ensured in the implementation and follow-up of the SDGs on migration. Now even harder work starts. Follow-up, monitoring and reporting on the SDGs will be a giant task for giants. An international migration policy index can be a very useful indicator to measure progress made regarding migration-related commitments. It may also be useful in order to identify policy gaps. In our view, the migration governance framework can contribute to the <coughs> development of such an index. At this time uh, of world distress, where migration often is described in terms of crisis and challenges, it's even more essential to concretize and facilitate for all states, <coughs> and facilitate for all states in implementing the 2030 commitments. To make migration reach its full potential as a means to this decrease inequalities and to reach the global development goals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Turkey followed by Switzerland, Armenia, Ethiopia and Libya. Turkey, you have the floor. Thank you, distinguished panelists uh, and the IOM providing us with the opportunity to discuss this very important topic. We believe that after agreeing on the SDGs, now it's time to work on to build peaceful and inclusive societies by making sure that migrants are well integrated and that their rights are protected. With this understanding and as the GFMD chair, we attach great importance to work on SDGs. 
at GFMD, we had a dedicated round table, held a thematic meeting, and also co-organized a side event with IOM on this subject. At the GFMD Istanbul Summit last month, as you all well know, we concluded once again that migration and migrants themselves can play an important role in sustainable development, both as beneficiaries and, and development actors. Leaving no one behind was another point underlined at the summit. In this regard, as a leading international migration agency, IOM has a significant role, we believe, to play to ensure the continuity of our ac accomplishment. Therefore, we welcome the migration governance framework that we believe is a timely and useful reference point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Turkey, uh, Switzerland, you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, <coughs> Mr. Chair. We joined uh, the voices of uh, considering the inclusion of, <coughs> inclusion of migration in the SDGs as a great success. Indeed, in 2012, many were the voices that claimed migration to be too toxic, uh, too impossible to be included in a new global framework for sustainable development. Luckily, we have proven these voices wrong. Uh, in that context, let me highlight the important work that IOM has, has done in reaching this <coughs> ambitious goal. Both on process, and here I would like to recognize the work, for example, that IOM has done in facilitating two global events that we had the great pleasure of uh, co-chairing with Bangladesh in 2013 and then in 2014, but also on operational aspects. I think the work that IOM is doing and uh, the entire staff of IOM really demonstrates that migration development is not a theoretic concept, it is something practical lived around the world by migrants and all the host communities and their families. So that made it more simple, that it is more evidence-based, the claim to have migration in the SDGs. If I may, I just want to quickly to raise four points. It is important to us to recognize that the new development agenda sees migrants not only as beneficiaries for sustainable development, but very much as actors for sustainable development. And I think this is something that is incredibly important also to change the perception of migration around the world. This is a call to include the voices of migrants in all development-related debates, in all development-related processes at all levels. I think this is something that we need to take forward throughout the process. A second point is also, and this very much speaks to the question of is or are we as a community working on migration issues fit for purpose? Are we fit to implement the agenda and are we fit to respond also to the possibilities given to us and the promises made in the agenda uh, to respond to these um, points? Here I would like to mention, for example, the role of the GFMD. It was uh, extremely important to have the GFMD as an intergovernmental state-led process to reach this goal. And here I would like to highlight in particular the chairmanship of Sweden and now Turkey, who has been tremendously important in reaching this goal. But also the high-level dialogue. We will have a, a third high-level dialogue latest in 2019. I think this is also part of the debate of moving forward. And as has been mentioned by previous speakers, I think IOM has given us with the migration governments framework, a very interesting instrument of tackling uh, the challenges that we have put in the agenda. A third point I would like to mention is that really to make sure that this agenda doesn't remain a piece of paper, but a, a vision, a, a, a tool to change the world, we need a global partnership. A global partnership uh, of governments, international organizations, civil society, academia, but also the private sector. And Switzerland, together with Turkey, we have proposed, and it was later endorsed, an engagement mechanism for the private sector in the GFMD. It will be rolled out under the leadership of Bangladesh next year. But this is just one element on how we could capture the important role of the private sector and if I may, this might be one of my questions to the panel. How does the panel see the role of the private sector in the implementation of the agenda with particular emphasis on uh, migration relevant issues? And the last point I would like to, to mention, if I may, is that I, I've missed a little bit the mentioning of the Addis Ababa Action Agenda. 
Now, I understand it is an integral part of the, of the 2030 agenda, and rightly so, but I think it is important to mention uh, and to specify the, the way that the Addis Ababa Action Agenda reflects, for example, on remittances issues that goes way beyond just the, the, the notion of reducing transfer costs. It talks about financial inclusion, it talks about financial literacy. I think these are key issues when we talk about how to make the best use of remittances. But it also talks about uh, crucial aspects such as uh, unscrupulous recruitment or the recognition of skills. So I think due uh, consideration has to be given also to the Addis um, Action Agenda moving forward as it is an important and integral part of the 2030 Agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Armenia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, we thank the distinguished panelists for their in interesting presentations. We particularly welcome the presence of Ambassador Donahue and his presentation of possible linkages between IOM and high-level political forum. And we, of course, from Geneva too appreciate the important role that the Ambassador played as a co-facilitator of the post-2015 intergovernmental negotiations and in bringing about the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Our delegation actively contributed to the discussions and to the shaping of the outcome document and in particular strongly supported the inclusion of the paragraph on the relevance of migration to the growth and sustainable development. Armenia has always advocated for a stronger international collaboration in the area of migration be it in the form of establishing new partnership for facilitating mobility of people or developing schemes for circular labor migration or for lowering surcharges for the remittances. And in conclusion, if I may echo the words of Director General, we're very much looking forward to the action-oriented proposals and projects in course of the closer dialogue between the United Nations and IOM for achieving the goals laid out in the 2030 Agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just say, we will, uh, we will go on until 12 before we start the general debate. I think this is such a, an important issue and we have such good presentations it's, it's worth spending the additional time. So with that, uh, Ethiopia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Director General. I have two questions for the panelists. Um, the first one is, and it's related to the last point raised by the colleague from Switzerland on the means of implementation. Uh, we are keen to the um, goal 17 of the 2030 agenda and also the Addis Ababa action agenda because unless you have the means of implementation, then it would be difficult to have the goals and the targets to you know to see them implemented on the ground, and in that in that in relation to that point, we would like to know from the panelists what they think about the I mean, the means of implementation, in particular in targeting the countries of origin and bringing about development related projects, linking migration to development and its impact on the ground, and what could be done. Like we know that there are projects, like for example by IOM. Uh, in terms of doing development projects to address the root causes of migration, but in linking this means of implementation and the goals and the targets, what could be done and what should we expect from Goal 17 and from the Addis Ababa Action Agenda? And the second question is, uh, looking at paragraph 20, uh, 23 of the 2030 Agenda, it lists a category of vulnerable groups uh, whose needs are recognized in the Agenda, like persons with disabilities, IDPs, migrants and refugees. And I was intrigued by uh, the comment of one of the panelists, uh, which I can quote, uh, migrants which are not clear, clearly refugees. And I just wanted to know from the other panelists and from one of the panelists who, who, who said this, uh, what, would, what would be the scope of the migra migration related goals and targets looking at the list in 23 and 
to one to the comment by one of the panelists, what would be the scope? Would we be expanding it, or would it be limited to just migrants? And just wanted to know your thinking of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Libya. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Director General. Uh, uh, and uh, distinguished panelists. Actually, uh, I just wanted to commend you for the excellent presentations. And uh, as well, uh, Director General, I can't help but express um, how much I admire the way you, you moderate these sessions. I commend you for that. Uh, I, I'm going to be a little brief just to uh, refer to certain points. First of all, we would like to congratulate this honorable organization for achieving that wonderful and, and very splendid goal, being able to incorporate the issue of migration into the SDGs. That's something really uh, worth uh, congratulating. And uh, it's, it's a good victory for you, uh, Director General, and for your organization. Now, talking about, um, I just want to raise one point here that uh, it's, a, it's in the form of question that, you know, everybody knows how the humanitarian situation is deteriorating in my country, uh, especially the uh, health system is already collapsed totally. So in this regard, those migrants that are stranded in our territories it's going to be quite hard, if not impossible, to provide them with, uh, with social and health services that are needed for them uh, due to these uh, circumstances that I explained. And until the country is free of this uh, chaos that is going on, we won't be able to do that. Not forgetting that the government is not able to take control of its entire territories. Um, another thing is, when it comes to, I, I mean, the, the, the question is, um, are there any uh, sort of consideration to, because you mentioned, one of the panelists talked about climate change. So what about countries that are facing armed conflicts? Are they going to be sort of taken into consideration in terms of the situation? Now. After the recent horrible attacks in Paris, um, I know that the issue of refugees and migrants somehow been uh, sort of a, a subject to a very negative impact. But I wish that these things would, would not have that kind of impact because we could always deal with that. Like, for example, um, uh, not putting categories in terms of refugees and migrants, sort of taking into consideration children and vulnerable groups like women and elders. I don't think those could be uh, categorized in terms of, uh, you know, being subject to be classified as terrorists. Finally, it's a point of order. Uh, I sincerely hope that there's going to be a day that this honorable organization will take into consideration uh, incorporating Arabic language as a language being one of the six official languages to be uh, also incorporated in the interpretation because I can't see, I can't see a reason why not. Uh, most particularly that most of the refugees now and migrants, especially uh, this year, are coming from countries that are from the uh, Arabian origin. So I wonder, I wish that this thing could be achieved in the future. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now call on the Integrated Center for, the International Center for Integrated Development, ICM AD. Uh, thank you, uh, Director General, for uh, giving this opportunity. First of all, I would like to thank all the uh, uh, panelists for their uh, excellent uh, and insightful presentation. Uh, and all the panelists uh, mentioned uh, in their presentation one word they referred the WTO uh, versus movement of people. And Director General, you have also mentioned about that and you coined another 
very important term for me, that is the demographic, uh, demographic deficit. Um, Excellence is all you know that the, the, this demographic deficit and this demographic change is, is a major trend is coming. And all, all we can remember that uh, the, in the, in the uh, uh, liberalization of uh, economic liberalization, trade and capital movement, uh, behind the main justification was the capital deficit or technology deficit in the LDCs. Now if we see that because of it, the, the change in the demographic, uh, this deficit in the north, my first point is that whether we can uh, we can we can have some vision in the long run. Uh, Mr. Paul also Fall mentioned that there is a compromise negotiation this time. Future, whether there is a, some a vision that uh, like goods and services, free movement of at least uh, labor force, economic migrants. And my second point uh, 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 to the panel and uh, to the director general is that uh, also uh, Sweden delegation also rightly mentioned that we need a global governance mechanism for migration. My point is then whether we can uh, foresee some of the organization like WTO to regulate and facilitate the uh, movement of people and economic migrants and or whether IOM can take forward to take the role of the uh, WTO or other organization. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, United States, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Director General. Just two very quick but related questions to the panelists. Um, I'm curious as to whether or not the panelists feel that custodian agencies, those agencies responsible for monitoring and tracking progress on the targets, should also be involved in efforts to implement those same targets, or if this dual role um, might create a conflict of interest. And secondly, and relatedly, um, IOM is regularly lauded as a highly operational effective organization, which plays a unique role with states, uh, made possible in large part by the fact that it is not normative and does not judge state action. Would this role change if IOM were to assume a custodian agency role for any of these migration-related target indicators? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ICMC, uh, I see John Bingham here. Thanks, uh, Director General. Over here in the corner. Okay. You know, uh, I'll speak uh, for ICMC in our own name and not, not uh, broadly as, as we often do for civil society uh, globally, but just really to um, echo with very strong appreciation a lot of what's been said by Mexico, Sweden, uh, Turkey, and Switzerland in particular. And maybe to, to wish that we had asked the question that the United States just asked um, of ourselves as well as of others on uh, implementing and measuring progress on the sustainable development goals. But really, if, if, if I could, just to go um, with um, an expression of appreciation to the whole panel, um, and, and in particular to the, the word, I think, from um, our colleague Gibral Fall and, and maybe Claire Melamed, the, the um, importance of being full the fullness of these sustainable development goals as they relate to migration, not only the six or seven that are explicitly referring to migration in such important ways, uh, but the broadness of the rest of the goals which ap apply across the board, um, leaving no one behind regardless of migratory status. So stay with the fullness um, of the goals as they are now and as they uh, project for 15 years. Very much appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Donahue and Mr. Ladd um, uh, referring to how transformative uh, these particular goals can be already and can be going forward. But on the fullness, also uh, in our own name as ICMC, we want to stand up and cheer for this migration governance uh, framework, which is, is uh, so smart and so full and actually so real already in so many ways in the work of IOM. Uh, ranging from work with diaspora groups uh, very recently and very strongly uh, with local authorities this very year. How practical can we get other than to work with local authorities and mayors and IOM is there. Uh, MICIC, uh, Migrants in Countries in Crisis, uh, the recruitment program in IRIS. Again, how real is that in, in some of these very, very uh, serious uh, elements of the, uh, and ambitions of the Sustainable Development Goals? Um, 
Uh, to my knowledge, I don't think civil society worked very directly on the migration governance framework, so it's even in some ways more amazing to us how, how good it looks. Uh, maybe if we were involved, we would have screwed it up. Um, but we really appreciate the references to the civil society five-year eight-point plan uh, of action, which uh, was entirely for collaboration with governments and agencies. So if we can, once again, be very much a part of uh, the um, implementation of this framework um, at every level, uh, picking up very much Switzerland's um, emphasis on the role of migrants and diaspora. And then to close with on the fullness, you know, all week we, we hear and many of us are saying uh, IOM is the world's leading migration agency. Well, this migration governance framework in its clarity and its, its um, practicality suggests IOM may well be already or be becoming the world's leading migration and development agency. Uh, so congratulations on that. Um, congratulations on your move in these very real directions to look at better relations and relationships in the UN system from civil society for ICMC. And I, I would say for our colleagues, we look very much forward to improving our relations and relationship with IOM in the execution of this very full agenda. Thanks. Thank you very much. We have two more speakers. I'm going to steal just a little more time from the general debate, but I want to give our panelists, it's been such a good discussion, and you've asked a number of very important questions. I want to give them an opportunity to respond. So let me take our last two speakers, try to be as brief as possible. I have Afghanistan and then El Salvador. Thank you, Director General. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, the panelists for their excellent and affirmative presentations. And uh, Mr. Director General, I, I would also like to um, thank you and uh, for your thank and congratulate you for your excellent leadership of the organization and your tireless effort to help people all over the world, as well as the IOM staff for their uh, deduction and hard work, often in difficult and dangerous situations. We welcome the IOM active uh, uh, to tackle um, and predict migration and humanitarian crisis. My government value close partnership with the organization which cover a broad range of issues, in particular, in assisting IDPs and affected communities combating human trafficking and migration management. Uh, Mr. Director General, if you allow me, I would just highlight four points, which is a priority for our government. Uh, number one, recognizing, recognizing all asylum seekers who have so far reached to their countries of destination without any kind of discrimination. Second, to help to find better ways to manage and facilitate economic migration between countries of origin and the countries in need of labor migrants. Third, help create better employment opportunity to prevent irregular migration. Fourth, deceives decisions by all countries to counter organized human and migrant smugglers network. Mr. Director General, you may aware that on the October 5th, our government has launched a program portfolio project for the migration and returnees of Afghanistan, which is the longest uh, in the history. Well, this project has been launched in the United Nations in Geneva, and uh, uh, this has been published in the website of UNHCR as well. Well, my question at the end is regarding the Article 10, which is uh, reduced in inequalities and uh, planned and well-managed migration policies. Well, regarding this issue, my question to the panelists and also the OIM is that 
in in this 66th uh, uh, executive committee of UNICEF and also the high level segment which was took place on 5th October in Geneva our government has been pledged to plan a, a, a program for uh, people not to immigrate abroad. My question to panelists as well as to, to IM is that how can we echo our plan or strategic plan for preventing people not to immigrants irregularly? Thank you very much, Mr. Director. Thank you very much, uh, El Salvador. Thank you. Good morning. I'd like to begin by congratulating the panelists um, for the very important uh, comments on migration. I don't really have a question as such. I just wanted to make some remarks about um, what migration means to El Salvador. Migration is also an expression of development. We think there are different interpretations in the international context. And we've seen that here. The whole of the international community is not united in the way in which it sees the migratory phenomenon. It's clear that some countries see migration with some concern. And there's some rationale to that. And then sending countries. Um, like El Salvador, El Salvador see it with great hope. El Salvador has uh, about uh, 3 million um, migrants around the world. And that is a very important experience for us. And that's why we consider migration um, as a possibility for development. And the sustainable development objectives um, can be a very important reference framework. Um, to support that development process through migration. And in that context, it's important um, to consider sending countries like El Salvador and how they have historic responsibilities. De considerar que a mayor well, desarrollo interno that, uh, hay the better mayores posibilidades de tratamiento uh, in el our tema country, migratorio the better we'll be able to deal with migration integral um, in a very integrated, comprehensive fashion, um, which will enable us to pursue sustainable development objectives um, that we see in this uh, sustainable development agenda. Tiene que ser un Migration factor permanente, estimulante y de perspectiva factor, y nunca uh, un factor que um, se trate hope aisladamente. And Estos comentarios sirvan al margen y creemos que estamos en una línea correcta we're going para along considerar the right precisamente in considering que los objetivos migration, de desarrollo sostenible the pueden ser un marco ma preferencial uh, uh, de referencia para el fenómeno migratorio como un factor de desarrollo. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can't really do justice to all of your questions and very rich contributions, so I want to turn it over to the panel now. Let's start with uh, Ambassador Donahue first. We'll try to wrap this up then shortly. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So um, I won't try to um, <laughs> answer all of those. I'll just pick one or two which struck me um, uh, during the discussion. Um, I mean, first of all, I, in my own remarks, I didn't actually refer to the uh, uh, the migration governance framework, and um, I, I should have. I mean, just from a, from a layman's perspective, I think this is an extremely valuable initiative. Um, I uh, I think that there is great value, leaving aside the SDGs, there is great value in uh, the IOM setting down some of the, or in fact, probably all of the concepts and principles which need to be followed. Um, around the world in, in responding to this challenge. So, I mean, I have to say, I think it's a very good piece of work uh, before one gets to the question of um, how, how it will fit into the monitoring of, uh, or the, the IOM's contribution to monitoring of the implementation of the SDGs. Um, I think that it, it is a tool which the IOM can use to engage in 
dialogues with other players in relation to migration, be it, say, the Human Rights Council or uh, the UNHCR or um, the ECOSOC Function Commissions. I mean, there, there, obviously there are many players. Uh, the IOM is perhaps the leading player, but there are many players who, who are relevant to um, finding solutions uh, and, and ensuring protection for, um, for migrants. So in the very first instance, I would see this as a document which enables the IOM to, to make a pretty fundamental contribution to the debate. You also, through this document, can um, give a structure and, and uh, an emphasis to, or really, let, me, let me use the word focus, that, that the document will um, put pressure on governments to demonstrate that they are uh, adhering to these principles in their own handling of migration issues. So you're really challenging through the IOM, uh, through this document, you're challenging governments to uh, to uh, prove that they are um, addressing the, um, the, the, um, the issues set out in 10, 7 and elsewhere. So um, I think it's a it's a very good piece of work, and, and um, uh, this is really by way of responding to Mexico, who asked really what what was our attitude to that. Um, the human rights perspective was brought out uh, well by Congo, and um, I thought that uh, this is the, I mean this this is it, it's crucially important that the rights of women and children, notably in relation to um, migration, are, are protected. And in the in the 2030 agenda human rights really permeates uh, everything and um, it is as fundamental um, in, as the, the notions of equality, leaving nobody behind and so on. Human rights in a broad sense uh, underpins everything we're doing <clears throat> and therefore it underpins um, the, the handling of migration within the agenda. The um, some, uh, I think it was Greece, asked about um, credible data. Um, I don't quite remember uh, where we have it in the document, but there is some some point at which we describe, I think, the kind of data that we want to see uh, covering all goals and targets in the agenda. And um, obviously, I mean, there are people better qualified than me, such as Claire, um, on this panel to, uh, to talk about uh, the crucial importance of data but in New York particularly we are we are highly aware of the challenge which arises for the smallest uh, member states uh, in terms of meeting the standard of of, of of data information which we have to have if there is to be um, a universal agenda and if there is to be universal monitoring of of uh, performance so really the data challenge is absolutely fundamental and um, uh, I, I responded well to what Greece was saying. The issue then of um, the goals and targets being as concrete and transparent as possible, which I think Sweden brought up, um, I, I just refer back to the exercise which I, I mentioned earlier, uh, myself and my Kenyan uh, colleague as, as co-facilitators tried very hard to get the targets up to the right technical standard. When I say try hard, the difficulty was really a political one, or, or let's say a procedural one, and that there was a fundamental um, fear about the consequences of um, reopening the package which had already been agreed, even, even uh, to make technical improvements. So despite that, um, Myself and my colleague pressed ahead with the, with proposals that we uh, put to the membership, where we had the uh, full support of the UN system um, through the interagency um, uh, mechanism that the Director General referred to, and ultimately we were able to get a small number of uh, amendments agreed. But although it mightn't seem like much, we did that in the teeth of fundamental opposition over many months to any changes at all. So um, now one of the little changes which came in, as I recall, was the reference to 
ending modern slavery and human trafficking. And we were quite pleased that we managed to get that in because it's obviously highly topical and that was a, a new element. Um, the, um, let me see, again, I, I applaud uh, the IOM also for having produced the, uh, the MGF so rapidly, with, uh, more or less in the same, uh, the same breath as the adoption of the final document. It shows that the IOM is ahead of the pack in, in terms of um, recognizing the, the need for very specific and focused follow-up. Um, I think I'll probably leave it at that. Um, those are just a few points that occurred to me. Um, the, the question of means of implementation is <laughs> obviously crucial. I, I can't myself, as a layman, quite see I mean, I, I can't give advice on specifically what means of implementation will be required to take forward the the uh, migration references, in, notably in, in, in 10.7. But um, uh, the, the, what I will say is that um, it is expected that Goal 17 and the uh, Addis Ababa uh, commitments will be reviewed fairly constantly in the HLPF. In, in other words, I, I don't want to be too specific because we're still at the brainstorming stage, but I would expect that uh, that, that that will be, um, uh, that the means of implementation will get constant scrutiny, uh, almost more than other goals. So within that, um, a lot of questions will be asked about the MOIs um, under specific um, goals. fair to my colleagues here, we're going to have to limit you to about one or two minutes each. We have to wrap up, so um, we'll see you all out. Um, fascinating series of questions. Um, it's always such a pleasure and a privilege to come into sort of intergovernmental bodies and listen to the experiences and the kind of the perspectives of different different governments have on, on these issues. Um, so just seeing as you're, you're limiting us, um, two points really. First of all, I've just been keeping a tally as we've um, had the conversation. I have recorded, I, this, this may be an underestimate, I've recorded seven different terms that we've used this morning to describe um, people who move. Um, I won't list them all, but I think there's sort of variety of ways in which we describe these groups of people and obviously the different meanings behind those words. We use different words for a reason. A one example of why having the migration governance framework and the work of the IOM in this regard is so important, and bringing some kind of structure and organization to this very diverse um, world and issue in which we're operating. So I very much echo the, um, the comments made that, that, you know, very much endorse that effort and, and wish it well, and linking to, a, um, to the broader issues, of course, around how we tackle these issues within um, global structures and the global governance of migration um, and the interaction of the IOM with other agencies more broadly. Secondly, there's been a couple of um, issues, questions raised directly to me about data, so let me try to tackle that. Um, the question of data and credibility is absolutely central, has been a big focus, of course, of the work of the um, Secretary General's expert group and the subsequent discussions within the UN and outside about data, not just, and I think it's always worth repeating this, not just to monitor the sustainable development goals, but the data that governments and other groups are going to need to actually achieve the goals themselves, the data for planning, the data for policy making, the data for resource allocation and choices. Um, I think credibility is, is absolutely the right question to ask. Um, there is huge amounts of data in the world problem in some ways is not an absolute lack of data, the problem is a lack of access to that data and a lack of confidence in that and a lack of understanding of what constitutes good data and usable data for different groups. Um, I think first of all we have to look to the statisticians as the sort of custodians of quality and the national statistical offices have an absolutely central place in this story as custodians of quality, as, as the develop, you know, as the key people involved in developing the methodologies and the systems that will allow us to make use of this data. But I think, as you alluded to in the question, 
the story has become much broader. We, governments no longer have a monopoly of providing data. We are getting more and more data from the private sector in the form of big data, from civil society groups and others. And increasingly, I think the role of governments is likely to be one of exactly that, of guaranteeing the credibility and the quality of that data. If I may, I think this also links to one very specific example of the role of the private sector and the link to migration specifically, in that um, obviously one of the issues here is the lack of data to track movement. And that is one of the areas where we're seeing very early interesting success from the integration of national data and statistics with new sources of data such as mobile phone data. And there's been some really interesting um, projects in that regard. There has this a new global partnership being established on data which is going to be experimenting with helping to form the sort of public-private partnerships but also guarantee the quality and the ethical standards that can make this work. Institution body or organization that does any implementation should do monitoring in my view. That's a response to the United States. But that is the monitoring that I would consider the equivalent of, that's the internal audit. The external audit, to me, that needs to be a separate entity because it needs to be viewed, it should be sort of viewed like Caesar's wife that is beyond suspicion. And many of us have suspicion as to government institutions monitoring other government institutions. So internal audit, everyone does it, external audit, an independent one. In terms of um, linking the comment question from, I think, is Afghanistan and Ethiopia, the ultimate vision beyond 2030 is that migration becomes a choice, not a desperate necessity. This is the big vision beyond 2015. Now, within that, some the SDCs, uh, SDGs mention particular vulnerable groups. I think um, in the implementation and the discussion has begun, people would have to think, think of which other specific groups and what sort of protection and support need to be given. But it's not only the vulnerable groups. The other side of it is diaspora, second generation, who already are part of the migration and development discussion, who perhaps don't need protection but have extra things to bring in. And finally, about the agenda, the Addis Ababa Agenda for Action, that brings in very many new forms of financing that we use in different parts of the world. It has brought it now as a formal part of the development framework. Again, my refrain is the same. We should have in the implementation phase a list of omissions and commissions. For example, with public-private finances, what are the things we must do? And most importantly, what are the things we must not do? Because we have experience in our countries how it undermines the public good. I think there was a, a couple of interesting interventions on the potential role of the private sector in uh, implementing the agenda as a key partner, and in particular its relevance to migration. Um, when I used to participate in the, uh, I think the first five or six GFMD processes, um, there was an attempt, of course, to make sure that external stakeholders could participate in that and present their perspectives. As civil society, strengthened within the GFMD process, it wasn't so evident to me that the, the private sector was doing the same. In fact, there was usually very, very spotty representation from the private sector. And where it where, where they were engaged, it tended to be directly uh, an attempt to get groups who were uh, involved in recruitment. Um, clearly, for, for migration, the, it's much more complex uh, on the demand side as well as on the supply side. I think if we were to truly get uh, chambers of commerce, trade bodies, local trade bodies, national trade bodies, you would hear a quite different take on the importance of a variegated skill set that migrants bring and contribute to uh, 
the process that will uh, lead to the achievement of, uh, of the SDGs and to stronger growth and to diversity and to all of the entrepreneurship and energy that, that, that migrants bring. Um, and just very briefly, related to, to that, there was a question about scope and what this agenda covers in terms of, of human mobility. And my interpretation is that it's, it's very broad. Uh, I would read the goals and the targets in conjunction with the narrative that precedes them. And I think it's quite clear that uh, it's referring to people that are moving for the full uh, variety of reasons. Of course, some of them because they're escaping conflict and violence and xenophobia and discrimination. There's a very unhelpful division that is growing up at the moment between uh, legitimate migrants and illegitimate migrants, and it's split down the uh, asylum refugee line versus economic migrants. And I think we have to do our best to uh, oppose that very false division and not use language that plays into that, because clearly people will move and are moving and will continue to move for a variety of reasons that relate to the uh, many unequal structures that we have in the world and the lack of opportunities that they face. Thank you very much. Wonderful discussion. No time for summary, no time for closing remarks, except to please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.